holiday called Halloween to kind of take a look at the realities of everything. First of all, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, Are not angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So here in Scripture, uh, we have the word angels. The Hebrew word is, is malak, angelos, meaning messenger. And so we have uh, the Bible talking about that, that angels are people, are, are beings that God created that minister to people and those that specifically know him. So in essence, there is a guardian angel and that God is watching over us and has sent his messengers all around us. Uh, angels were created uh, by God um, and the Bible talks about good angels and evil angels. And we know this from scripture, all angels are created. First of all, none of them are uh, omniscient and omnipresent and, and, and from eternity past to eternity future they are, but from eternity past they were created at some point in time that, that God created them. The Bible talks about both of these, that, that, that God made them and after Satan's rebellion, and, and we learn about that in Ma Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. Many remained faithful to God and some did not. The Old Testament says a third, and the New Testament as well, a third of the angelic host uh, fell to earth uh, because they they chose to uh, exalt or follow Satan, who was the most cherished of angels, kind of the steward of the throne of God, overlooking the glory of God and his power. He had such a lust for that that pride overtook his own heart, and he became rebellious to God. Pride does that and destroys everything. Pride is the sole source of all contention. And so Satan himself falls to pride and and many identify the demons of the new testament with those fallen angels in matthew 25 revelation 12 there's a lot of scriptures that talk about um the uh the angels being fallen and those that haven't fallen and the old testament title angel of the lord that that you may read about um is is often by uh, theologians thought to be the pre-incarnate Christ, the, uh, in theological terms, is called a theophany, an Old Testament appearance where, where the Son of God, Jesus, uh, came and appeared in the world, sort of like when the angel, the messenger of the Lord, came to visit uh, Abraham and told him about Sarah, that you're going to have a, a child in your old age, even though you're 90 years old, and she's in her tent laughing, right? Um, there's a lot of those theophanies throughout the Old Testament where Jesus, the Son of God, was very active in all that had happened from creation creation to crucifixion from crucifixion to ascension from ascension to when he comes back for his church and then from that point on for eternity so in just a basic things uh, the uh, angels who are they the good ones anyway for now let's start with this i have a list um do i have a slide here with that list on it i think that i do um here it is Good angels are spirit beings. Now, we get uh, a lot of scriptures uh, here. Just, just go through them uh, real quick. There are a lot of them, uh, multitudes upon multitudes. We don't really have a delineation as to how much. I would imagine there uh, are billions. They worship God. Um, they do his will. Um, it, the Bible goes on to say uh, they see his face. They are obedient to Christ. Um, they have abilities that people do not. Um, they've been given uh, special strength, as we see in some instances, and, and special knowledge by God that people do not have. Uh, they have different ranks and functions. First Thessalonians 4.16 talks about different ones. Uh, uh, for example, in Jude 9, in the Michael, the archangel, and some of these others, they have a different uh, level of responsibility. Uh, they do not, or they, they're not married, Matthew 22. And it says they, they are not given or have been given in marriage. They are immortal, Luke chapter 20, from the time that God created them. They are for eternity, just like mankind. Um, they are not to be worshipped, Colossians 2.18. Um, there's a lot of things about angels that the Bible talks about here that would definitely contrast the ideas of modern thinking in many Christians. I have heard at more than one funeral service that I have condu conducted, even yesterday, how that many believe that their loved one is an angel now, and that they are with us, and, and they are present, and they are watching over us, and, and all these things. Well, the Bible does not support such a theology. And um, to believe that is really, not, is really to be misled, because the Bible says to be apart from this life is to be with the Lord. We are the saints of God, the purchased by His blood. We have been given a high 
high priority by God himself. And we, the Bible says we have a song that the angels can't sing because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. So what is the role of angels today? Uh, a lot of the angels' roles related to Christ's work, and I have another list here, and this is all in your outline. It's a lot of information, so I, I chose to put it on there, and you can take it home and look at it for this first part before we really get going here. But they rejoice over one sinner who repents. Uh, what else do they do today? They care for God's people. Uh, today they give direction. Uh, they appear in dreams they can appear in human form, usually as young men, as we learn in Scripture. Uh, they protect saints who fear God and, and hate evil. They bring answers to prayer. They're God's messengers. Um, they strengthen people in, in trials. Uh, they wage war against the demonic, the Bible says. They carry the saved to heaven. They observe the church on earth. They're watching, and they're part of everything that's going on. So this is a pretty encouraging thing to recognize that God has a role for these angelic beings, and they're very much real and here and present with us today. The Bible also talks about the end times and the roles of angels during the end times. As you right now know that we are getting ready to begin more of uh, chapter 7 a Revelation and going on with the seventh seal as it opens. And we're going to discuss all of that in detail more next week. But right here, right now, as we look at what the angels are doing now, also in that end time, they are very active. God has responsibilities in Scripture. Revelation 12 says, The war between Michael and with the holy angels and Satan with his demonic host will intensify. So there's already a battle going on. Um, this, when you pray uh, and we intercede, I believe that God does send his warring angels, friends. Remember, and, and the reason that I get this is from many places in Scripture, but one great illustration is the story of Elijah. Remember, he is there, and his servant is going, we're surrounded. There's no way we can have victory as the army was all around the city. And he prayed. He put his hands on him. His eyes were open, and he saw the armies of God around the outside of the enemy. And his eyes were open. That's the same way, friends, I believe today that, that we pray, and we're not praying to angels, we pray to Jesus. You don't pray to the dead. The Bible says have no communication with the dead. I'm afraid the Catholics have that part wrong. God bless them. But uh, as, far as, as far as those warring angels, God has a plan for those in your life and my life. There are things happening in the spirit world that you and I can't see, but that's the place where they're doing battle. So um, the, they're... The second one is the holy angels will come with Christ when he returns, and they will be present at the judgment of the entire human race. The Bible says that they are there. So scripture, the Bible has a lot to say about good angels and what they do today in our lives. And this is great, and that means that, that, that you and I have an assigned angel right here with us, and Scripture says that those who are living for Christ have a protective buff angel around them. I like to envision them as being buff, because I don't think there's any puny angels, all right? I think that they're the buff ones, and the two-thirds that chose to serve God and love Him, I think they're buffer than the third that fell from heaven and are following uh, the mastermind of, of uh, deception. So why is all this necessary? Well, because I think it's, it's important that we understand that we are in a real battle spiritually. And the reason kind of for the break in Revelation and, and this today is for us to really be aware of that, that God has in mind for us to be engaged in the spiritual battle. Friends, when you see things in the natural, it is only an indication of something happening in the spiritual. That when you and I return to our knees and we begin to call on the Lord and we sense the presence of His Holy Spirit and we pray the promises of God that are in His Word, we're engaging in a spiritual battle. It's not just the words you say, whether they're flowery or they're, you feel as though they're inadequate. It doesn't matter what we sound like. When you engage in that way and you cry out to God, you are engaging in the spiritual fight. And, and we need to understand that. And, and oftentimes we deny the Creator and we're worshiping and obeying Creator things because we look at our circumstances and we let them discourage us and we let them pull us down when the whole time God is saying hey I don't want you to look at what's going on just out here I want you to take that to your knees how many times have I known many people myself included will see a big storm coming in life 
there's a desperate situation, there's a disastrous financial issue, or there, there's, a, there's a relationship issue, or there's something going on with our children or, or something, and we look at that circumstance, and our first reaction is to fear, right? And to go, oh, no, look what's coming my way. I, I don't know what's going to happen now. I have to crawl under this rock and hide. When the Bible tells us that God doesn't want us to do that, in fact, Paul writes, be anxious for nothing, but in all things in prayer and prayer, petition present your request to God and the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus that's a powerful promise so friends when you feel that grip of anxiety or those things coming over remember that's an action in the flesh God is not wanting us to take he wants us to take that anxiety to him in the spirit and say God you are great you are the one worthy the enemy still wants to destroy your family he wants to destroy you and, and he is knocking on your, your family house's door, and he's trying to get in to ruin your marriage, to ruin your children, to ruin your future. And we are in a battle. We're in a fight. This is where we get into the fallen angel part. So we got these holy angels, the Bible says, that are set apart, and they have all these purposes, right? All the ones that we find in Scripture that I, I've laid out for you here that God has great directives for you and I through them, that, that he is going to deliver his word to us. His promises are certain. The Bible says they're yes and amen to those that believe. And the angels are simply messengers of that good, good thing. But when we talk about the other side, the demonic or demons, a lot of things happen, and sometimes there's a variety of reactions. Number one, when we hear about demons and their power and what they do, some we choose to dismiss that altogether. We dismiss the demon, demon idea or the demonology of it and, or the theology that uh, the demons can have the influence uh, in this world or over Christians or anything like that. And this is, are you switching me up here? Don't distract me now. I'm already going. Um, uh, this is the civilized Christ Christian approach. I would put it that way to make to give it a label to make it a myth or not relevant to contemporary life. That the demons are just a thing and it's just mythological. We don't have to worry about that. Um, it's, it's primitive. We don't have to deal with it anymore. So that's one reaction. Another reaction sometimes people have number two is to interpret the stories about demons. So yes, it's an old story, probably a psychological and mental health issue that was going on and, and sort of a naturalistic approach that demons weren't directly involved with the ones that, that Jesus cast the demons out of or, or that Paul or Peter and all of these things, uh, all the, the healings and stuff from, or from demonic oppression that people have been relieved from that because it was just a psychological issue and a very naturalistic approach, never giving any credence to the idea of anything really spiritual. A third reaction is to accept the stories as they really happen, but they're not for today. Oh, I read the Bible and I see that what happened back then is it's not really for today, and so um, I don't have to worry about engaging in that battle. I don't have to, to be in that. I don't have to be concerned about that at all because that happened back then, and, and there's nothing like that going in our world today. And, and we're more advanced. We've outsmarted demons. We've got drugs now, so we're good. Viagra's fixed everything. Number four, the fourth reaction, uh, still many others over-rationalize because our education about demons comes from horror movies. We see horror movies and we go, oh, that's how demons really work. More people get theology in America from movies than they do from the Word of God. So we've got this constant battle of, of, of drag me to hell movie or something like that that, that shows uh, something else. Or Freddy, Freddy the 13th, Freddy Krueger coming out as some sort of, of demon-inspired person. We have television shows about them, uh, demon-inspired people that are, are now uh, in this uh, whole world of Dracula and the werewolf culture that has overtaken America with such bad acting in these shows. I'm surprised they've made anything. But I, I mean, it's surprising. It's, it's like, are you serious with the acting in this? Pro I watched one program and it was filled with demonology. They all are. These werewolf shows, it's riddled without and throughout with demonology. And, and pantheism is really strong, especially in Star Wars. For those of you Star Wars fans, yay. Um, but all of these ideas are in culture, and it's because Satan has a plan to monopolize people's reasoning, to transfer 
sound theology of a person is to grab them when they're 10 years old and plant in them the idea that this and this and this are true when actually they're quite the opposite. Our mind rolls back, some, some of us, to the 70s and, and early 80s with images of the exorcist and dolls that kill people and the demon-possessed cars like Christine and Chucky and dolls and toys that attack you. I mean, what a lovely thought, right? So sometimes we over-rationalize it. We think, well, you know, our education comes from horror movies, and, and it, it is true. Fifthly, some attack, some react with the reasoning that if we bring attention to it, we give ourselves an unbalanced approach to spirituality and, and, and real faith in and, and God and make it a circus show. Let me tell you, I have seen, and I haven't seen it for quite some time, but I have seen a person that has been demonically influenced, that is obviously not a believer because believers can't be possessed by the devil. The Bible says the Holy Spirit is in you. It's impossible. But Christians can be troubled by the demonic. And I think this is something for us to understand. Even though Christians are not possessed by the devil, that we can be troubled by it. Now, I wrote a book, the Stronghold book. It's out there in the foyer. You can grab a copy if you want that goes over that whole idea. And I don't want to get into it a lot this morning because I want to focus on um, the other side of it. Sometimes all of these things make sense. Each one of these five rationalizations can come to a point where we ignore it. But then the other side is that some people tend to over-sensationalize the idea about demons, have an unhealthy appetite for cast demons out of doorknobs or cast my toaster didn't cook the toast right so I've got to lay my hands on the thing and I got to pray over it in Jesus name that that toaster will give me bagels that are made perfectly for my cream cheese because it burned them the last time and some people actually they really do this there's stories uh, people have written books about uh, traveling way up in somewhere where there's a ton of ice and going into these ice caves to to find that the devil that was trapped in the ice it's tormenting them way over in Arizona somewhere and they, they're they're there to chisel the ice out and melt it down so that they can cast the demon out of the thing and I'm not kidding you that's very real and and when you think of spiritual warfare then at that point what do you think of and sometimes people believe that it's it's a specialized form of ministry you know we have to hold the crucifix and do this and we got to um, speak in Latin right some dead language and nobody speaks anymore Man, many actually believe it's if it's it's exorcisms and deliverance ministry or certain types of intercession and and we seek out the super evangelist because he's the one that's going to be able to heal us and and do this great thing you know, or the guru from some that wrote some book and has uh, hotel meetings all over America because people flock to see them and hear them speak but friends we are following Jesus we are following Jesus and when Satan came to him three times and, and tempted him with the things in that wilderness, what did he do? He quoted the word of God. He used the word of God. And every time he used the word of God, the devil fled, fled from him. Friends, we have that same power today. There's a lot of pictures in, in, in Scripture about this. and There's a lot of um, uh, things that we as followers of Jesus need to understand in this world that, that also we really do have very real enemies. The human race, we have a lot of issues. We got violence and poverty and bitterness and crime, terrorism, duplicity and betrayal and brokenness. And, and, and how do we quantify all the evil in this world if the demonic is not at work? It is at work. Satan is alive and well, unfortunately, and he is the master deceiver. And, and we find in Scripture there are levels of organization in his government and he has strategically planned to attack the, every person, the more depressed. He, see, he's not worried about the one that's far from God. He's not worried about the sinner that's out there diving themselves. They've already opened up their heart to his wickedness and evil. He's more concerned about the church. He is coming after you. He's coming after me. He's a one, master deceiver. He likes to cause you trouble. He likes to give you issues. He likes to make you think twice. He likes to make you doubt. He comes. He doesn't want you to be a Christ follower. He didn't want anything in the world. He wants to take you away from faith in Christ and especially from the fellowship of the believer. And, and he's in a real battle. He means business. If he means business, we ought to as well. There's pictures of spiritual warfare throughout the New Testament. I, I think I have a list here and 
the strong man, Luke 11, uh, Satan is fully armed. Uh, uh, someone stronger comes, Jesus. He conquers the strong man, takes his armor. Matthew 10, 34, Jesus to bring a sword, brings the sword. And in Luke 4, 18, Jesus came to proclaim liberty to the captives. So he's fighting. There's a spiritual battle going on. Matthew or Mark 5, 9, uh, Colossians 1, 29, the demonized man with a legion of spirits. And uh, as we, you can read that, and Jesus led the evil powers, the Bible says, in a triumphal procession. He took captives out of that place. And, and what a powerful scripture. When he uh, went to the grave, he, he, had, a, he had some uh, jobs that he did. And one of them was, was kicking some rear end. And, and he did that. And he took the, the keys of hell, death, and the grave from the enemy. And he, he led captivity captive. He brought those out, the, the God followers. And he brought them out of that place. And the Bible says that people uh, during that time saw many uh, people who had died walking around. Uh, and, and for, for 500, and, and at this one place, Jesus was seen. Uh, he spent 40 days extra before he ascended, after he resurrected from the dead. And, and all these people are walking around, and people are going, hey, I see dead people. That, uh, they're walking around. What's going on? Because he brought them literally, physically raised them from the dead. I, this is, this is a, a, a spiritual battle that was witnessed uh, in the flesh. Hebrews 12, the Christian life is, the Bible says, a struggle against sin. 1 Peter 2.11, the desires of the flesh wage war against the soul. Jude 3, Christians are called to struggle for our faith. Philippians 1.30, Paul struggled for the gospel. So what struggle would there be if there was not the demonic and the evil at work? 2 Timothy 4.7, Paul, quote, fought the good fight. Philippians 2.25, Philemon 2, Christians are souls. Soldiers. We're called to be soldiers. And, and Ephesians 6, 12, Christians wear armor. There's a lot of indication here in Scripture. I go on on Revelation uh, 6, 12, uh, 13, 2 Corinthians, Revelation 19. The beasts of the kings will make... Uh, uh, of the earth will make war. Satan gathers nations for a final battle. All this is spiritually influenced. All this is spiritually derived. We often say, well, the Satan made me do it. Well, Satan didn't make you do it. You must be some spiritual giant of Satan who is not omnipresent, came just after you. He has beings to help him. He has individuals that will help him. And these individuals are part of the demonic, and they're not Tarzan. They're part of the demonic. For those of you who heard that ringtone, it was awesome. So demonic forces are at work, yes. Does the Bible talk about them? Yes. Christians are in a battle because they've, be, uh, Christians are in this battle not because, as I said before, they can be demon possessed, but rather because we can be influenced and terrorized by fallen angels. We are in a spiritual fight. In fact, very rarely do we find the concept in Scripture of demon possession in the Bible. In fact, that literal connection in the original language, you won't find it at all. Well, Pastor, I thought there were demon possessed people. Well, we rather find the idea in the, in the translation of the word of a person being demonized. And the work of demons to illustrate fear, to run interference in, the, in, in lives away from Christ. Because you see, Jesus and confidence in him starts a spiritual role in a person. It starts, if you will, uh, a spiritual battle that goes on that con is contrary to the work of the enemy. The work of demons is to illustrate fear and, and to run interference. But Christ followers, we have so much more because we have the Spirit of God in us. So can Christians be troubled, tempted, or bothered by demon influences? Yes. Can people really use the excuse, the devil made me do it? No. Because nine times out of ten, the enemy of the flesh is the flesh. Pam and I, when we were youth pastors in Winston... Uh, Oregon, right next to Roseburg, where the shootings were at Umqua Community College. Pam attended there um, for a class or two. I don't remember. It was just a couple. Um, I remember we were we were in our apartment, and we were laying there in our bed, and it's like we felt, we sensed this thing, this presence. You don't hear me talk about that. I don't like to over-sensationalize you. Know, he gets no credit, Okay. But, but we felt just this heaviness, and we just closed our eyes, and we prayed, and, and we felt that thing leave. And 
I believe that Christians can be influenced. They can be caused to, to be tempted to fear. You can be tempted to have uh, certain doubts. And, and today, the Bible says Satan, in much like his, co his cohorts follow his example, is an angel of light. So he looks good at the, to those that are, that are doing, uh, going about life. And this is the reason that we have so much compromise today. And, and a woman came to me one time and said, Pastor, we've noticed weird stuff going on in our house, and there's all kinds of things going on, and I saw this, and I'm like, whoa, I've never seen that before. So do I think she's lying? No, I don't think she's lying necessarily. Uh, I think that Satan does things and manipulates us and manipulates our mind. Uh, can demons manifest themselves physically? Some people say, well, you know, I've never heard that said, you know, uh, demons can, you know, actually look like people. Well, demons are fallen angels, so let this mess with your theology a little bit. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. This is amazing. There's been a couple times in my life where I've heard stories about people in this situation, and they, someone helped them with something, and then they turned around and they were gone. I'm sure you've heard those kind of stories. Do I doubt them? No. Uh, being a very pragmatic Bible teacher like I am, you see I go through Scripture very thoroughly and logically and liturgy. I like that. I like going through it that way. But I, when I come to this topic here, friends, spiritually I cannot deny that these things happen. And we must be willing to say, okay, God, you're calling me to have a deeper relationship with you in the Spirit. That's all the reason for this is. It's for us to dive into Him. Uh, let's lay some biblical foundation for the topic. A few scriptures. John 14, 30. I will not speak with you any longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. He calls him the prince of the world. Ephesians 2, 2. In which you used to live when you followed by the ways of the world and, quote, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 calls him the God of this age. Ephesians 6, 12 says, The powers of this dark world uh, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 1 John 5, 19 says, We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So there is something that we're not seeing, and it's not talking about our president. We might like to think so sometimes, but it's not. It's talking about the fact that the whole world is under the oppression of the evil one. Sometimes we look at people in culture and society, and we've already made them out to be the Antichrist, right? I mean, people have been writing books about that for years, and we're going to get more into the Antichrist next week because there's a lot the Bible has to say about him. He's a very interesting fellow. But that's not the point. The point is that God has in mind for his people to be engaged in the spiritual realm. In America, over the last 200 years, we have advanced psychotherapy and medications to deal with demon-like behavior. And don't get me wrong, there are a lot of conditions where there's a chemical imbalance in someone and they can be treated uh, with drugs. And we've seen this. I've seen it right here at church where we've sent us, uh, some people many, over many years here to a Christian counselor and there's been a, a chemical imbalance issue and they've been able to be treated for that. I don't discount that. I also believe God heals. We've seen him heal and deliver. But I've also seen a, the miracle that comes out the other side when the, these conditions are treated properly. But we shouldn't discount the fact that Satan is at work. Today in America, we, we see it in the, the fringes of our culture. But if you sit with some of our missionaries sometime and just talk to them, they share incredible stories about people who are demon-possessed, hearing weird voices or, or fits of rage or physically attacks, physical attacks from people that and they're very strong and all these kind of stories that go on and, and that the practice of exorcism is very real. Um, one missionary was talking about this so much so that he said, uh, we were concerned for a long time that the, the people that we were ministering to would begin following this other one because they seemed to have so much power. And then we began, they took some Christians and they began to go in front of this guy's house every day and they began to pray a certain time. And after a while, he shut his doors down and all kinds of stuff happened. It was amazing. I don't know how many of you remember years ago with the video series that we showed here, Transformations. How that when God's people got together and they began to pray for something, everything changed. In South America, the carrots were this big. I kid you not, they were huge. The whole valley transformed because they came to Christ. They began instead of uh, uh, the Saint Day parade, which they the Saint Day celebration, which was basically a figurine of Michael Jackson that they all brought and paid homage to. I saw the thing. 
finally, when, when he was defeated, all the churches began to get together because they were separated. They began to get together and pray. God took drunkenness away. The, the crops increased five times in three years in this community. It, it's absolutely stunning because God does things. When we engage in the spiritual, God works in the physical. Paul puts this in perspective for the believer. Ephesians 6, 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a lot of avenues of the demonic. So if I were to ask you, you had an enemy, what would you do to destroy him? Well, I think there's a couple things that might top our list. Number one, you'd kind of research them to get to know what their weaknesses are. Some of us head into the battle full strong on, both arms swinging without understanding his tactics. The second thing is you defend yourself and attack with extreme prejudice. You don't want the enemy to, give up, to, to get up. You want him to stay down. It's important that we give each of these two things very special and equal attention, that we have to understand how the enemy works, and then we have to just stand in the word of God and trust God to do it. There's a few ways that, that people... Uh, they blame everything on the devil and we never take into account the influence of the world on us but there's a few things that people do to intentionally come into contact and and open up their heart to the demonic number one is to intentionally invite them in false religions witchcraft sor sorcery um, channeling all of these things are, are brought out um, and certain transcendental meditations have transformed into into certain forms of even yoga that might seem uh, harmless on the surface. There's a magazine called Tarot Therapy. Uh, it helps people get post-traditional psychology and, and focuses the opening of one's spirit up to in a way through, through the tarot cards, um, all focused on some meeting with some trans and transpersonal powers is the thing today. Remember uh, Linda Evans for years, she had a house back here off Gravelly Lake Drive. One of the, She was into this uh, channeling of this ancient warrior. What was it called? Um, Ram Ramtha, and, and she would trans, and now they've got a place out here, I've seen, I've driven by it, out uh, past Ording Eatonville somewhere, um, Yelm, yeah, I was driving out there, so, oh, hey, there's a sign for that place where the freaks go, but uh, anyway, they said that about Pentecostals, too, I better be careful, um, fascinating, uh, fascination with demons, and, and, and werewolves, and, and yoga. Christians can stretch healthily. Don't get me wrong. But the, this philosophy is opening up the spirit of a person. There's these ideas of angels within us. There's a books like this, uh, websites, Ask Your Angels, A Book of Angels, Guardians of Hope, and the Angels of Mercy, and all giving instruction how to communicate with these angels. And it's n nothing new. It's just a for new form of an ancient form of polytheism. And, and But what it does is it it causes a person to open up their spirit. You can find instructions on the, on the web for an archangel called Raphael instructing people on how to get in touch with their angel. And In fact, one of the little blurbs in there, it says, to start working with your higher self and guides, uh, Sinandra and archangel or ascended master, all you need to do, listen to this, is invite them in. You do not need to know how to formally meditate to channel this. Just relax in a laying position and set and, uh, and state your intention to work with them. As you become sensitive to your higher self's energy, you can set up a communication system with them. When you feel guilty, when you feel their energy strongly enough, you can ask questions of them to get responses through the energy. That's directly from the website. Very interesting. What it is? It's following the same example as one opening up their spirit to Jesus. What do we do when we come to Jesus? The Bible says we confess that he is Lord. We confess that he is Savior. We believe that God raised him from the dead, that he died on the cross for our sins. And if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that he is Lord and make him Lord, then he is Lord. And we are saved. The second thing Residual influence from the past. Sometimes people open up their hearts, allowing past sins to cast a shadow of guilt in our lives. Many have used the, the term generational curses. I don't like to use that, referring to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, and Deuteronomy 5, 9. But Exodus, Ezekiel, excuse me, chapter 18, verse 20 says, the soul who sins will die. That sounds like a personal responsibility. Then look what it says. The son, oh, do I not have that? 
Ezekiel 18.20, it says, The son will not share the guilt of the father, nor the father the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous man will be credited to him. The wickedness of the wicked will be charged to him. In other words, my dad, I'm riding on my mom and dad's coattails spiritually in church. I know I'm a Christian because I'm following them. It's not good enough. We need to have our own faith in Christ. Many places in the New Testament make salvation the individual responsibility. In Mark chapter 16, 15, the individual who hears and believes will be saved. Salvation is one thing, and that's important. Christians can be troubled as a result of having these things in their lives in the past. Witchcraft, sorcery, and other religious practices. The imagery of today's games, a lot of them are uh, they, they, they are so vivid and so powerful, and, and they, they work in a lot of ways similar to these channeling ideas. I mean, if you look at some of the, the video games that are out there today, a lot of them have, have the idea of gaining powers by students, or they get the kids in a role-playing game, and that can make them more susceptible to opening their spirit up to these other things. More than anything, it's just created a lazy culture, I think, so people don't want to see God. They sit home and play, play uh, their video games all day. I can't understand that. I don't play video games, so I don't get it, but some people do, so I don't want to offend you. Already done. Uh, the Bible says... You know, about Abiah in First Kings, that he committed the sins of his father. Nadab, the Bible says he did the eyes, evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father had done. Basha did evil in the eyes of the Lord, or walking in the ways of Jeroboam, his dad, in his sin. Isaiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord because he walked in the ways of his father. We find those indicators in one generation. We know the principle is true. What one generation allows in moderation, the next will allow and indulge in excess. If we see alcohol a little bit in one generation, it might come out and, and portray itself. It has a greater percentage of happening in a greater way in the next generation. God wants us to be careful in these things in our life and be aware that there is a very real spiritual battle coming on. Thirdly, another way that people can uh, open themselves up to the demonic and be, become uh, influenced by being demonized is unintentionally inviting their presence. And this is through the habitual practice of sin. And I got some great scriptures to back up this reasoning here. This is the most important and most influential of all demonic influence because it works in cooperation with our flesh. Our flesh likes stuff. I mean, just look at me. You can tell I like pizza and lasagna, right? It's written all over this part right here. Um, but the Bible says in Ephesians 4.27 to not give the devil a foothold. To not let him come in and, and grab on to me. Not give him a position, a power over me. This is a wrestling term. Where you get them in a certain hold, in a foothold, and they have no defense. They can either break their leg off or they can surrender. We don't want Satan to get us in that kind of foothold. When you are constantly engaged, friends, in the sensual, in alcoholism, in doubt, in addiction... Something very powerful is at work, and the danger of it is that it will pull us away from knowing and loving Jesus. I believe that with all my heart. There's a very real possibility that the, as we open up and we continue a habitual sin, that, that after a while we lose our desire for God, and we lose our passion for worship, and we lose our desire for His Word, and after a while we become cold and far from Him. These are desire to, to pray and to seek him and serve him with his people. And this is why I always uh, try to call people. Sometimes we don't see him for a while because I'm worried uh, that if we don't see him together in God's house, and you should be too, that something's going to hold of them. It's more than football and hunting. Something's got a hold of them. And don't let an offense drive you from God's house, friends. Don't be a child and stomp off and say, if it's not my way, I'm going to take my bat and ball and I'm going home. Come on, that's good preaching there. This is a place of unintended consequences when we continue to live this way. Jesus says in Matthew 24, 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. We've got to be on guard. Our culture and our world is filled with wickedness. 
And it has a direct impact and influence on the church and, and God's people. And God's calling us to this, this great power and this great victory where even in our gatherings we would see people healed and restored in their marriages. Or, 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 or God would meet their need in some powerful way as we worship together or in our homes. That God has all this great stuff in store, the outpouring of his Holy Spirit in his church in, in a dramatic and awesome way like we could never anticipate before. Not living yesteryear, but for right now, all of these great things things and yet there's something that doesn't just jive there's something that doesn't quite work or else how do we know that because it would be happening and the reason is the increase of wickedness has influenced the church that our compromises outweigh our passions oh pastor now you're meddling big time there's special attacks against the Christian. Deception, temptation, physical attack, special period of attack. Ephesians 6.13 kind of describes and goes on because the day of evil is coming. Spiritual warfare is a work for every believer. Ephesians 6, our full armor chapter. How do we respond to the enemy? The real enemies that we have. Let's finish. Number one, practice honesty and live with moral integrity. See, God's called us to be saved, but he's also called us to live for him. He says here to put on your pants, and it's no coincidence, wear the truth. In, in Ephesians, put the whole armor of God, he says put on honesty, if you were to follow it out. Um, stand firm, the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, fit, fit it with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Take the shield of faith, helmet of salvation, which is a sword of spirit. Pray in the spirit. These seven things. Number two, develop personal holiness and good behavior. He talks about the armor, the breastplate of righteousness. Realizing that your, your status before God is one that has been acquitted of all guilt. He has acquitted you. Um, the third one, that he, he talks about the boots. Uh, prepare yourself for sharing the gospel of Christ wherever he calls you. Number four, don't doubt. He says, take the shield of faith. Believe that I have an answer for you. Share the good news. Believe that God will help you to overcome. Friends, and oftentimes the temptation when we get in the middle of a desperate circumstance is to forget God altogether. Dwell, dive into self-pity. Oh, man, I am preaching to myself. What we do is we get all these circumstances and we get all this stuff going around us and we decide that maybe God's not enough and we're going to figure it out on our own. And God says, wait a minute. As he, the Ephesians 6, 13 through, through uh, 18 here has for us, he says, "Put on, take up the shield of faith. Believe that God will help you overcome. Friends, don't doubt. Believe it. Don't trust, uh, don't trust your employer. Don't put your confidence in your wealth. Believe. Number five, he says, be sure in your identity in Christ. Put on the helmet of salvation. Your theology, your thinking, your mind, your, your knowledge of the word of God, the, the attitudes that you have that pour uh, from, your, from your mind because of your worldview. What is it? Is it established in Christ? Number six, know scripture and apply it to every difficult situation. He says, take the sword of the spirit. We need to devote ourselves aggressively to knowing the word of God in and out. That's why at Abundant Life we do, often through series that we're doing now, we go verse by verse and we say, this is what the Bible means. Bottom line is pray, and he says that to pray in the spirit on all occasions. This last scripture, 2 Peter 2, 4 to 10, is just tells us about this spiritual fight. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in a gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood and its ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others, if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who is distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, uh, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented, um, in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and how to hold the righteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful nature and despise authority. So God's judgment is especially true for those, but God's promise is especially true for those who are following him. I like that list of promises, friends. It says that no matter what spiritual attack you're under, no matter what kind of things are bringing you down, no matter what's going on with you, that this 
battle in the Spirit is won through Jesus Christ. This battle, in the Spirit, it might take you some time. Sometimes we come to the altar and we lay out, oh, God, take care of it. And we walk away and we trust him in that moment, but then we walk right back out with the same problem. Man, friends, sometimes it takes staying there in that posture of prayer, staying on our knees and saying, God, do you hear me? I'm crying out to you. Lord, listen to my cry. Hear my prayer today. I am longing for an answer to this. I need you desperately. And, and tell him the situation and pray the promises of God's word. We've become so lazy with this. The power of the church today against the demonic is the power of the individual person in the church breaking through in prayer. Something that we've lost today. Something that's not even thought of much more in the, in the church where we spend time seeking God until God shows up and does something amazing. Until he speaks to our heart and says, okay, you're done. Go and get some rest. See me at work. He does this. And as we learned last week, he sends trouble so that we will seek him. Preach it to myself. Let's pray about it, shall we? Stand with me. I'm going to ask Pam to come and just play and... Um, Let's follow the Holy Spirit, shall we? Jesus, we love you. We thank you, God, for this day. I thank you for your church, God. And I thank you, Lord, for the potential, God, that is right here in this corner of Lakewood. God, that you have put such a, a, an interesting group of people together with so much diversity and talent, God, with so much uh, different things, God, that are coming together as a church family. And we're here, Lord, because we love you. Lord, I also know that in this room, each one of us are, are battling, we're fighting. There are struggles in the flesh. There are struggles, God, that we see in the flesh that we need to be able to turn around and say, this is a battle in the spirit that I need to fight and assert myself to. God, I pray in Jesus' name, Lord, for your Holy Spirit to come and to fill